units, if they can deliver a lot of social housing in that mix, and if they can do that off balance sheet, well then that is, um, that's a very, that's a good outcome. Um, um, uh, that isn't restricted in the way that uh, publicly financing local authority build um, would be in terms of the fiscal rules. So we just need to be sensible in terms of what we demand of NAMA, in my view. Uh, I am quite demanding of them, actually, and I've met them a number of times, um, and we want them to deliver in this area for us. Um, it's just, sorry, just, uh, you, you did indicate NAMA have the potential to deliver 20,000, and Part 5 uh, would give 2,000 units. Well, that's an automatic but I, delivery, but I would I expect know, you, that we'd go beyond that. Yeah. Do you have an indication of what you expect out of the remainder? Like, wh how far could that go? No, look, I don't want to put a figure on that. Um, because Minister, they're not going beyond 10%. So, are you going to issue them with some new order to go beyond it? Well, I mean, with respect, I don't see how you, you, you'd be able to say that definitively. They sure. are. Sure. sure there's two NAMA states in my constituency. Yeah, 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 there are NAMA states in your constituency, yeah. but there's 20,000 houses that are going to be built. You have no idea what percentage of them will be social or not. Well, it'll only be 10% unless you tell them otherwise. Unless local well, authorities engage. Well, that's, Is that what you that's actually not necessarily true because, I mean, NAMA already through the NARPS model, uh, you know, are making houses available yeah. for, for approved housing bodies, which has nothing to do with their 10%. Right? So, 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 I mean, you know, let's not assume the worst here all the time. Uh, uh, um, I expect and I hope that, that more than 10% of the NAMA build properties will be available for social housing through various different mechanisms. Uh, and let's work out development by development how we can um, maximise the appropriate level of social housing as part of, um, of mixed developments. Um, in terms of uh, um, the, the questions around rent controls, uh, <coughs> linking rent to CPI, I know Sinn Féin had a motion of that, um, on that this week that they put down <coughs> as well, um, and security of tenure issues. Look, I mean, I think that um, if we had... Um, a more normalised balance between demand and supply, uh, then I think we would need to be looking actively at how we can create a more, I don't know, European-style uh, rental market, whereby people would choose, uh, or certainly an increased percentage of people would choose to rent for their lifetime, uh, as is the norm in most European capitals. People who don't want to take the risk of taking a mortgage out, um, then, you know, many, many people choose to rent for their lifetime, and they have security of tenure around that choice and so on. In Ireland, traditionally, people who are renting are people who are in transition, people who can't afford a mortgage, um, uh, uh, or people uh, who are uh, choosing to rent for a temporary period, or their students, or whatever. Uh, this uh, you know, ambition and aspiration to own your own home in Ireland you know, drives an awful lot of the the housing and property market in Ireland. Uh, and I do think we need to change that narrative. Um, but I'm also very conscious that at a time when we need to dramatically increase supply, we need to be very careful with what we do or say around security of tenure, uh, particularly after making decisions as recently as last November uh, around um, you know, two-year rent reviews and a whole series of other things that are trying to improve security of tenure for tenants. Um, you know, if you're going to come back and review that on a regular basis, uh, there is the potential to undermine the confidence uh, and the appetite for significant investment in the property market to increase supply. Uh, and so trying to get that balance right uh, is, is, I think, quite a delicate balance, particularly when we have such a, an imbalance in the, in the uh, supply versus demand um, in the property sector. Um, the, the, uh, um, you know, we'll, we look at that. Um, <coughs> so, um, so, I mean, I don't have a straight answer to that question yet. Uh, I'd be interested, actually, to see what you recommend in terms of trying to get that balance right. Uh, and we'll, um, uh, uh, we can comment on it when, you, when that's, um, that's made. In terms of some of the points that, um, that uh, the Deputy Butler raised, um, we'll follow up in relation to the Waterford uh, project. I mean, for me, that, that, that sounds like just a lack of urgency. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, that actually they're just going through procedures when they're ready. And that's not good enough, actually. Um, you know, everybody needs to play their part now in responding with a sense of urgency. And when you have straightforward projects that, that have no 
reason to be slowed down or no impediments or barriers, well then we should be getting on with them quickly. Um, the, um, can I just say in relation to students, because I actually think, and I assume you're going to look at this in some detail, but I think the opportunity in student accommodation to have quite a dramatic and positive impact on the private rental sector is very significant. So if you look at, um, if you look at the stats, for example, in this um, recent study, which I assume you've seen um, uh, from the HEA, uh, you'll see that you know, there's a deficit of about 25,000 in terms of formal student accommodation. So you have you know, private and public student accommodation provision that's there. And then you have about 25,000 students that are, that are accommodated in the private rental sector uh, who are living in, uh, uh, in homes that actually families could be living in. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so I do think that we should be looking at trying to create a dramatic increase in the on-campus and near-to-campus student accommodation. Uh, I think the solutions around student accommodation, particularly around rapid build technologies, modular units and so on, uh, you know, student accommodation is quite different to a family home. Uh, and I think uh, some of the solutions that we should be able to provide could be put in place a lot quicker than, than maybe conventional housing and could free up a very significant number of places over a short space of time. So I've already met um, the universities on this. Uh, it's not as straightforward as we thought it might be. Um, uh, and again, it comes down to, to financing and procurement, uh, and in some cases planning. Um, but it is an area that, um, that I think we can do a lot on. Uh, in terms of, of VAT rates, look, ultimately this is a, a decision for the Minister of Finance, uh, but obviously we'll be talking to him, and he's, he's an active participant in the Cabinet Subcommittee on Housing. Um, it's really about balancing um, how you use the tax system uh, and whether or not you get a bigger bang for your buck than if you actually spend on the capital side. Um, and there are also accounting rules that complicate this. So, you know, if you, if you are um, uh, if you're increasing your capital spend, you can account for that over a four-year period. Uh, if you're, if you're um, reducing taxes or giving tax exemptions, uh, you need to account for that in full in the year that it applies. Um, so, you, so again, there are, there are some restrictions uh, around tax reductions uh, that don't give you the same flexibility around increased capital spend. Uh, and again, um, we need to try and get, um, get a, a balanced understanding around how we can spend available resources as effectively as possible to get more houses built or more houses acquired or more vacant properties into use and so on. Um, um, just, uh, yeah, just, just the point that Barry raised in relation to rural Ireland and rural towns uh, and villages playing, playing a part here in the broader housing strategy, that is, that is important. Anybody who's read the programme for government would see that there's a big emphasis on, I think, what's described as rural revival. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, if we're going to be building you know, over 100,000 houses in Ireland over the next five years, uh, well, then we should be using that opportunity to try and revive and revitalise a lot of towns and village main streets uh, and to get, you know, communities and attractive living there. Um, uh, and, um, but that being said, I think, you know, the big numbers and the big pressure at the moment certainly is around the big urban centres. Um, uh, so uh, I think... Um, I think I answered most of the questions. A couple there, of other questions, but just one technical one. Uh, Minister, you, you indicated uh, that the, you know, the ambition was to build the programme up to building 25,000 houses per annum or more if possible. You were saying this at the beginning. And I suppose we can all clearly see there's a supply side shortage at the moment. And I suppose the challenge is to ensure that over uh, the medium period that the supply and demand are more or less match. And I suppose in that regard, the analysis and the, uh, I suppose, the decision making that the department is doing, is that based on CSO information? Like, is that the way you're, you're planning it? Yeah, no, well, in terms the, of family, the, family yeah. units, demographics and so forth, is that based on CSO? Uh, well, well, the 25,000 figure from what I know is, um, 
uh, uh, is a housing agency figure, uh, but it's also backed up by a number of you know, economic think tanks in Ireland and so on. I mean, there are very few people who would disagree that in a country of a population of around 5 million people, you need to be building about 25,000 housing units with the demographics that we have. Certainly the ESRI supports that figure. But I think most people would also accept that because of the deficit of the last decade, that actually we need to go beyond it. So, so Ruth, the point you make about 25,000 housing units not being enough, I think is a fair comment. Uh, I think it isn't enough. Uh, and we need to go beyond it if we can. But like, let's face it, last year we built 12,600 housing units in Ireland. Uh, many of them actually were finishing unfinished apartment complexes and some housing estates. Um, half of them were one-off houses across rural Ireland. Um, um, so uh, actually even getting past that figure this year um, uh, will be a challenge. So we are at less than half of where we need to be uh, if we didn't have a housing crisis. Yeah, that's, Minister, that's what I was trying to get at. The 25,000 uh, is the maintenance figure year on year. I think so, yeah. Plus, think then, be... plus to deal with the deficit is the additional. Yeah, that would be my view, yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, look, let's, let's try to get to 25,000. I mean, that would be a huge achievement if we can get to 25,000 in terms of delivery in advance of 2020. Um, but if we can go beyond it, I think we should be aspiring to do that. And, th and that's why I've said when I've been asked, and it's just a straight question to a straight answer, you know, in a perfect scenario, how many houses would you like to be building per year for the next 10 years? I'd like to be building between 30 and 35,000 houses if we could. But we are a long way away from that at the moment. Um, and it's going to take us some time to get there. And in the meantime, we need to focus on the people who need houses the most. Uh, and they're people who are homeless, who, who are on waiting lists. Uh, and that's why there needs to be a big emphasis on, uh, on, uh, on social housing or public housing. Thank you, Minister. Uh, one or two more questions. Uh, Deputy <coughs> O'Dowd, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I welcome the Minister? Excuse me. <coughs> I'm slightly hoarse. Um, and I welcome his commitment to the significant changes that need to take place. And I welcome the fact that you're gathering around you a team of experts in the department and outside of it. And could I ask you that if there's anybody of that vintage in the department when uh, Minister Tully was a minister, uh, I think in the 70s was the 80s, uh, there was a huge housing building programme then. I know there were different times and there were different uh, issues, but it was a very successful building programme. I think that was around 19, 1974, 77. There was a hugely successful building programme then. Uh, and at the foundation of the state, from my reading in my history books, Charles Townsend says that one of the most important things that were done was a huge public building programme at that time. So there's, there's history and there's tradition and there's also the facts. The facts are that there's a huge uh, underclass of people who are in desperate conditions, uh, emergencies in Drogheda and in Dundalk and all around. It's a hugely difficult problem. And uh, the difficulty is that I think that the social housing strategy, as you outlined there, and I know it was 19, uh, sorry, 2004, 14, rather, doesn't go far enough at all. And what I would ask, Minister, if you could look at uh, the percentage build per county in that strategy. Some counties in that strategy are meeting something like 40, 50 per cent of their waiting lists. In other counties, it's much less. In County Lyle, I think it's about 25 per cent. Uh, of the need, of the present need, will be built. Whereas I know that in Tipperary, I think it's in excess of 50%, if, if I'm right, <coughs> if my recollection is right in that. Uh, the other point, the other weakness I see in the strategy is that we're relying 75-25. Uh, we're relying on the private sector to provide something like 75% uh, of the social build or the, the social occupation in Dublin and Cork and Watford uh, and in Galway. And uh, the houses aren't there at the moment. They're not there at the moment. Um, and I would welcome the increases that you may be talking about. And I acknowledge the, 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 the benchmark you're making that if there is a deal to be done with the private sector in the supply of housing, it must be reciprocal. In other words, uh, my view on that is that you should offer uh, to, to the private sector the attractive long-term lease options in terms of if they do a significant deal, say for five years, with the local authority on the HAP scheme, uh, then there would be a significant tax break to them. I think, I think there has to be a quid quo pro and there must be 
clarity then there must be supply but I think you've got to attract them into the market and attract them so they will give it to the HAP applicant rather than avoid the HAP issue uh, which is happening in some cases. Uh, the other point about NAMA, the facts are that local authorities have let down let down NAMA in, in the greater Dublin area, thousands of houses offered to them for social housing were refused by the local authorities in Dublin. That's a fact. Uh, and when we question them, um, it is a fact. Now, I didn't interrupt you, the it's Deputy. Not a fact. It's uh, sorry, Chairman, uh, would you oh, ask uh, Deputy Ruth Coppin for my post? No, no, it was actually. It was around the country, 2,000. No, no, it's 2,500 was the total number taken up. Taken up out of 6,000. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, th th those are the facts. Uh, it doesn't suit uh, Deputy Coppinger's narrative, and I'm sorry if it doesn't. It suits you to keep involved in that. I, I do think, Chairman, uh, if she wants to, to speak formally, no, maybe... Please, do, 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 yeah. you have the witness uh, is the Minister, so if you have questions... So, so, so the, point, the point I want to make is, is that... <laughs> 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 the witness for the prosecution is beside me here, I'm afraid, Minister. I'm trying to provide an adequate a proper defence and a rebuttal and attack as well. No, it's uh, just a fact. Can I just say that, to go back to this very point, Nama said very clearly here that those houses, while some of them were in, were in unfinished estates, they were, they were offering them in a finished state. In other words, they would finish them. So I am concerned that local authorities do not have, do not have uh, the commitment to build what they need to. And I acknowledge the fact that you're meeting the county managers or the CEOs on a regular basis, but I think there are huge issues around that. In the past, the National Building Agency uh, did design and build. They actually designed for the local authority, they put the schemes together, the local authority went ahead and built them. That's, that's my recollection of them. So I don't know where the NBA are now, whether they're gone or they're in heaven or whatever they are, but they were a very good body. They designed very fine housing, uh, which, which worked and they supplied as you're saying the expertise to the local authority was there uh, through, through the NBA. Uh, the other point I want to make is that the question of the private build, how do you encourage uh, private enterprise to get involved? Uh, I feel that, and I've said this earlier uh, at earlier sessions, there's a lot of money out there in pension funds. There's a lot of money in uh, other countries like Canada looking with huge amounts of money, say, for uh, pension funds ready to invest in long term, but not very high return, but, but significant over the long term. So I would like to ask, you know, what, what can we do to attract more um, more of that money in, because if they're guaranteed that there's a demand, which there is, and if they can give us a supply and if we can give them the, the rents that they will need to meet the expenditure, that to me is, 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 is a very significant uh, progress that could be made. Could I ask you about that? Uh, the bill to lease, if we, asked, if we asked private developers to say, OK, um, Will you build to lease? In other words, I presume that's off government balance sheet. If, if, if a private contractor comes in and he builds houses and then he leases them to the local authority and the tenants pay for, for, for whatever that is, is that a model that should be looked at? To me, it makes a lot of sense because we're not going to meet, notwithstanding your programme, and you're right, you want to build 35,000 and you're right every year. It's not going to happen unless we get other people into the marketplace. And I just have a couple of other, other points I'd like to make. Uh, I welcome what you're talking about, uh, you know, your, your, your planning reviews, but one key point for me is that local authorities have infill sites, they have lots of land, bits and pieces in towns and cities and in the countryside. Uh, state companies like CIE, state companies like, you know, uh, you know, aboard the morning and all these states, they all have land banks. God knows, I don't know where they are. I know, I understand the government is doing an inventory of those. You know, when will that be to hand? And I think you have to use, uh, you know, you, you'll have to use hard bargaining with them uh, to ensure that if they're in the right place, that they come into the public supply. Uh, the, the, the example I'll give you is Gormanstown Army Camp. It is about 200, it's in County Mead, it's about 200 acres there. There was a proposal some years ago uh, to take on 60 acres of that, that there would be housing. 
but it never actually happened. So, I mean, there is land, uh, you know, a place like Gormstown, you have the infrastructure there, you have the network of the motorway, you have the railway, uh, you have proximity, reasonable proximity to towns, a good public transport. Uh, so I think you need to ensure that all of the land that is in significantly located areas in public ownership is released into, in, into this, this supply that we need. And um, sorry, I just have just a couple of other points that I want to. Want because to I want the minister yeah. to have an opportunity to respond. Well, I, I wanted to, and like yourself, I've sat here, and I'm the first government speaker. Thank you, chairman. And I've, I, I'm not going to be rushed in my final part or my last bit of the question. <laughs> Uh, I did the building lease, the NAMA homes, the land banks, the planning review, yes. I think that that's a key thing as well, um, that we need to look again at fast track planning. I don't know if it makes sense or not. I think somebody spoke about reforming part eight, but I think that if, if, in a, if, a local, if we can fast track the planning in whatever way it can be done. And the last point I'd like to make is that England, uh, or Great Britain have a huge public housing uh, supply. They're, you know, it's, it's a massive, they have massive operations there in the United Kingdom. What can you learn from the United Kingdom? What wealth of information is there that you could access or get? Or perhaps they might have experts on this issue. Go, you know, building, rapidly building a significant number of houses. So basically the final point is, what is, what is the knowledge that's out there? What research and information uh, can you get to clarify, you know, to do, to do this job? I think after the Second World War, they had a huge public housing building programme then. So maybe there are lessons or issues we can take from that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Minister, uh, Minister, I'll take, there's only one final person, which is Deputy Wallace. And uh, Deputy O'Dowd, some of the questions, if the Minister doesn't have the exact response. And no, no, just one moment. In relation to NAMA, there will be representatives of the four local authorities here this afternoon who may have further detail. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yeah. That you may have more detail right. because the Minister is neither NAMA nor the local authorities. But I just make the point that, oh, that. the four local that authorities may be able to assist you this afternoon. Yeah, but the, the point, in more just, detail. Chairman, just to come back to you on that, the point I was making in oh, no, response to other points, that NAMA is the big bad wolf. Oh, yeah. NAMA, in fact, offers for thousands of houses. And all I'm suggesting to you That's is the reasons that you're looking for, the, the four local authorities may be able to address specifically for you this afternoon. Deputy Wallace. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Just on, on Fergus's last point, um, you might find it interesting if you just check uh, in The Guardian uh, for the last uh, three or four weeks, there's articles on the huge problem they're having around uh, housing provision in Lingen at the moment. It is a crisis uh, that's coming close to our own. Um, Minister, um, I, I get the impression that a huge stumbling block uh, for the challenges that are out there at the moment is around uh, funding, how all this is going to be financed. Um, the price of the money, uh, can we get money uh, at around 1% rather than being driven into the hands of the PPPs, uh, which are an outrageous price for the state. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem, and you, know, you, you use uh, the reason sometimes that, oh, you know, you can't do this because it'll drive it off balance sheet and it becomes problematic in how the money is assessed and whatever. So that's a, a huge obstacle uh, that we have to overcome. And uh, as I've said before, uh, it is clear that other states in Europe have booked the rules when it suits them. And just to give you one example, this year the French are going to break the fiscal rule in order to deal with what's called an emergency around security due to the ISIS attack. Uh, we have an emergency around housing. and. Uh, I think we should be looking for some leeway from the Europeans as well, uh, the same as the French have done. And uh, Austria, Lithuania, Spain and Italy have already indicated that they're going to break the fiscal rule as well uh, in 2016 and probably won't suffer any great high, uh, price for it. Another issue around funding is that uh, there's a lot of development that could take place in the country. But uh, the builder or developer, or uh, sometimes the mixture, of the, sometimes the same first person, struggle to get access to funding. The banks are not lending uh, for this area and are unlikely to start lending, and uh, the government are unlikely to start telling the private institutions, even if we do happen to own AIB, what to do. So 
the state, uh, do you not think the state is going to have to play a serious role in funding projects? Uh, and you, you mentioned uh, that deals can be done with local authorities around social and affordable and mixture with private. And I agree that would be great if you could make it happen. Uh, but there seems to be some serious obstacles about making that happen as well. Uh, I, I, I was speaking lately only uh, to um, a guy who was looking to build uh, 30 units. And he was trying, and he was. Uh, prepared to do a 50% split between private and, and social and uh, looking to do some sort of a deal with the local authority in terms of some upfront funding to uh, go towards their original, their eventual take from the project. And uh, the local authority didn't really seem to feel that it was doable in that manner and that there's some uh, uh, things, some challenges I think that need to be addressed in that area with local authorities. Um, Back to my first point, Minister, um, you say that, okay, we, NAMA came in here and uh, it was actually very interesting listening to them because they made it very plain that they have a commercial mandate, 100%, and that the notion that they had a social one was really uh, a kind of a figment of our imagination, despite that it was the fact that it was mentioned in the legislation. But they were unapologetic about the fact that they will do as they see fit to maximise the commercial uh, venture that they engage in. Now, uh, you're saying that they will probably develop, deliver more than the 10% social. Um, well, given the fact that, Minister, you're t you, you talk about uh, the significant, you say integration is key, and you obviously you, you agree that affordability is a big challenge. Um, but NAM have kind of admitted already that the majority of the units they're going to build are not really affordable for the people that uh, are actually struggling to get units and will be continuing to get them in the next few years. And you, you say your action plan will focus in particular on those feeling most difficulty in accessing the housing and rental market at the moment. But the 20,000 houses that NAMA are looking to build is not and the majority of their, the units they build are not going to address that focus. That's a fact. Right? Now, Minister, uh, aside from the fact that uh, they were also unapologetic about the fact that uh, they are engaging now with vulture funds in, in developing a huge tracts of commercial that is very, going to be very lucrative. Uh, this, and I understand that that, 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 is a, that is a commercial decision, and I can understand the logic of it, right? But the, the, the sad part about it is that it is at the expense of the residential market. And uh, it, it would be so much better if the state had a more hands-on approach as to how NAMA operates. And you, you say again that it drives it off balance sheet if you, if you reduce the commercial mandate. And it would probably be disingenuous of me not to add the fact that I have serious concerns about the fact that we are hanging so much of our hopes on an agency called NAMA to, build it, to deliver, to deliver 20,000 units when only this week two of their former employees have been arrested in Northern Ireland. And it is going to have serious repercussions and it isn't going to go away. And, uh, I'm not so sure that these are the organisation that we should be depending on uh, to deliver so many units. And uh, I think maybe the government needs to look at it uh, as to uh, just whether it is right to go down the tracks. I mean, NAMA seem to be here for the long haul uh, without actually having uh, addressed so many issues uh, over the last couple of years, and you were saying well, we can't be too demanding of NAMA. Well, it would be wonderful if we, could if we could demand accountability and transparency in how they've operated. Uh, just on, on, the, uh, on the issue of carrots for um, the private sector, now listen, uh, I don't live in Cuckoo Land. I realise that 70% uh, of the people will continue to use private housing in some form or other in the, uh, in the next uh, 10, 20 years as well. And, but I, I would actually argue that we have 
serious problems around how we deliver private housing as well. And the lack of the, the, the affordability element is directly linked to the fact that it's a dysfunctional market as well. It's, it's very much unregulated. But uh, I just want to make the point, Minister, I wonder, you're thinking about come up, coming up with incentives, maybe tax incentives, to get the private developer back into the market. Well, Minister, uh, would you, uh, are, are you aware that there's a lot of people, uh, um, investment funds or vulture funds, as you like, whichever you like to call them, them uh, that are sitting on some really good sites in Ireland, and they're looking for incentives to start building and make it more attractive to build. Well, I would like to warn the government that if you're, you have to be careful that some of these people have actually no appetite for building at all. Right? They're actually planning on flipping it when it's more attractive to flip it. And uh, they're actually looking, they're lobbying for incentives with a view to making their assets more valuable. So I would, I would suggest, Minister, that if there's going to be any kind of assistance to actually attract the private developer back into the market, it has to be some. It has to be formulated in such a way that a reward comes at the end when you deliver the units. In some form, I don't know how you do that, but if if it's done up front, these guys are going to make a killing, and they're going to go off uh, laughing their heads off. Now. Uh, now, I, I realise that that is, I, I'm not suggesting for a second that it's not complex, that it's easy to do these things, I know it isn't, um, but I think it's something uh, that has to be avoided, uh, because w w you, you have, uh, there is a danger that we're going to actually drive up the, the, the value of the development land that's ready for building. Um, just on, uh, on the part five issue of the 10%, um, I just, I've admitted. I don't mean to be interrupting, but if I'm going to be able to answer questions, I, I just, yeah. I, I do have a cabinet meeting at two o'clock. That's my only problem. Like I'm not. I'm not okay, I'll okay, sure. I, I just make one more point there. Very briefly, I'll actually yes, go yeah. with one, one right. point, right? Um, there's, um, there's apartments advertised this week Watling Street, Cork Street, Middle Garden Street, Dublin's Man, right? Yeah. Just, just to give you one example Middle Garden Street, there's 10 one beds, 5 two beds. Rent roll, 153,000, right? It's coming out, they're roughly about 1,000 each. Who come out down and they're advertising the fact that the buyer will be able to actually achieve a rent roll of about 228,000? That's a 50% increase, right? We can expect at least half of those people to get tossed out of those units because they won't be able to afford to pay the new rent. I'm wondering, is there any capacity? I mean, these are units. We're, we're looking at paying a lot more to produce units, right? And these are ready-to-go units. Some of these are going to be uh, become, become vacant, and, and the people in them are going to be coming, going around looking for a new place. Is there any way that the state can engage in buying property? Even, at the moment, this is, this is occupied, but it should stay occupied. Because and, and if, I'm sorry, but if vulture funds buy them, they won't stay occupied because they're going to put the rent up and make them unaffordable for these people, and somebody else is going to move into them, and they're going to be looking for a place. The state should be looking at bargains. Now, uh, Fergus was given out about the fact that uh, local authorities are guilty; they didn't buy up, they take up all the NAM options, right? Well, it was very unfortunate that the local authorities didn't get a better pick of what NAM were offering, because number one, they offered them the trash; number two, they didn't offer them a lot of very suitable units uh, that, that uh, w the local authorities would have jumped at, and that was unfortunate. So they sold the cherry peat, they, they sold the lovely stuff off uh, to the investment funds, and they, they, they offered much more poor quality stuff in a lot of cases to local authorities, and you'll find, if you analyse what the local authorities turned down, more often than not, there was a good reason for it. Peter Wallace, do you want to afford the Minister All right, a chance okay. to respond to you? Sorry, go minister, ahead. you have yeah. a couple of minutes, and okay. there's quite a lot. Well, on that, I mean, on that particular Particular question. You'll get an opportunity to uh, to ask questions of some of the chief executives or, later on. I think Dublin authorities yeah. are here this afternoon. Yeah. So I think you'll get hopefully get some answers there. Um, but I do know that NAM has spent tens of millions of euros doing up properties, making uh, to make them um, um, uh, uh, suitable for, um, for social housing. Um, I, I don't have the exact figure, but it was it was a very significant figure. Yeah, uh, fairness, now, Minister, NAM has spent very little on social housing doing up properties in proportion to its budget. Well, I'll get you the figures if you well want. They, well, they spent the 100 million euros making properties ready for social yeah, what's housing. What's their budget overall? I know, but look, 
But Ruth, I mean, oh, that doesn't matter. No, no, of course it matters. But I mean, 100 million euros is a very significant investment. Not in that. It's 36 housing. billion. It's not that. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll look look okay, budget. Deputy Coppinger, please. Yeah. There, there well, 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 look, Deputy I mean, Wallace. We can have a long debate yeah. about the remit of NAMA, but I mean, like the whole the whole vehicle that is NAMA was set up effectively to take broken balance, uh, br br broken um, um, property related loan books off our you know off our banking system, and their remit was to try and minimise the exposure to the state financially of that, and that is the remit that they continue to work out, which is why they do have and they are unapologetic about it, a commercial remit to try and do that. And they are predicting that by 2020 they could make a profit for the state of up to 2 billion euros. Now, we are trying to ensure that within that remit, um, that we try to work with NAMA uh, to ensure that we get the maximum dividend that we can from that entity in terms of uh, housing delivery in a timely manner given the, the influence uh, that they have over loan books and the linked security to those loan books, which involve land banks all over the place and properties all over the place. Uh, and, and we are trying to work with them to maximise that dividend. And we'll continue to do that. But to simply turn NAMA into something different essentially turns it into a state agency, which brings its expenditure onto the books, which causes all sorts of disruptive uh, and negative impacts in terms of what they would be allowed to spend. So we just need to be careful on that. That's all I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that they don't have a very significant, or that, that they don't have significant um, financial muscle. Of course they do. Um, but it's how we use that and how clever we are in terms of um, um, managing budgets uh, 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 you know, in a way that can deliver for us without impacting on unavailable uh, spend. Um, <coughs> a load of questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to see the state buying up properties. Right? That's the first thing. Um, you know, I've spoken to the housing agency. They have strong views on this as well, um, uh, particularly vacant properties. Um, yeah, I would like to see uh, a, a purchase program where the state looks for bargains, looks for properties uh, that may, be, you know, may not be in the market but may be coming uh, you know, at some stage in the next couple of years, uh, and that we are proactively looking for, uh, to acquire particularly properties that aren't occupied at the moment uh, to be able to you know, increase the number of um, uh, social ho housing units that we have. Whether that's talking to banks uh, uh, about, um, you know, about the, the properties that they have uh, in terms of um, um, uh, properties linked to, uh, to loan books or whether it's just in the, in the private market generally. Um, so I, I absolutely think that one of the ways of getting a, an immediate uh, increase in stock is to simply acquire, but obviously uh, um, uh, the preference is to acquire uh, vacant units where possible. Um, in terms of um, access to funding, um, I mean, you're right. You're like, there, there's actually no shortage of available funding at the moment at very low cost. The problem is how do you spend it and, and through what vehicles do you spend it? So if a local authority borrows money and spends it, it gets added to the national debt. You know, it's as, it's as simple as that. So, um, you know, we have worked very hard in recent years to try and get uh, our uh, our national debt levels down, uh, and uh, and so obviously um, uh, we need to be cautious in terms of how we finance clearly. Uh, what's needed here, which is to uh, to increase supply and the mechanisms by which we do that. But we did have uh, Deputy Cowan earlier talked about the NARPS model that NAMA have been using, which has been a very successful model. We're going to try and learn lessons from that and see if we can replicate it. Um, we have you know, the Housing Finance Agency that's able to raise money uh, at very competitive cost, um, but they can't simply give it to local authorities without without there being a, a subsequent uh, consequence of that in terms of public spending in any given year. Uh, likewise, the, um, uh, uh, the, um, the credit unions want to be able to, to lend money into uh, helping to solve a housing crisis. Um, but again, we need to make sure that we can source money as, uh, as cheaply as we can. So, so the NTMA, as you know, Deputy, can raise money, uh, very significant amounts of money, very, very cheaply. Um, that's not the problem. The problem is how do you spend, spend it in a way that doesn't undermine competition rules, um, in other words requires a, 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 a commercial rate of return 
in order to avoid it uh, being considered as, uh, as national spend uh, uh, and, and avoids um, uh, state, aid ruled, uh, state aid rules complications. Um, in terms of some of the points that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that Fergus raised, yeah, I mean, I think there are lessons to be learned from the UK. I'm actually going to Derry uh, in the next few weeks to um, they have a very active social housing bill program there, um, and, um, and I'm, I'm interested in really understanding how that works uh, and, um, uh, uh, and the successes and, I presume, some failures as well that have been there. Um, in terms of uh, planning review, um, I mean, it, we do have a lot of pl uh, active planning permissions out there, but I also think we need to be able to get decisions through the system quicker, um, and um, particularly at a board Pernola level, uh, if they need re more resources. We're not going to look at you know, spending hundreds of millions of euros building houses and then having unnecessary delays because of you know, half a dozen or a dozen people that may be needed to, um, uh, from a human resource point of view. So we need to make sure that if there are blockages uh, that have solutions around human resources that we that we deal with those quickly um, so we have capacity to get um, to get things moving uh, around land acquisitions that's a really uh, important point uh, I think that there are for example other agents of the uh, state uh, and and other state-owned companies um, that need to play their part here in terms of supplying land banks to local authorities to be able to build homes uh, Irish Rail, I think, is probably the best example of that. That's true. Um, uh, absolutely. So, you know, if you look at a lot of the, uh, if you look at Limerick, if you look at Cork in particular, if you look at Athlone, um, you know, there are very strategic and very large land banks, often in city centres, actually, um, that are never going to be used really for commercial rail uh, in the future. Now, obviously, Irish Rail have to get a commercial rate of return for an asset that they own and is on their balance sheet, and they can't simply write it off without all sorts of um, accounting consequences. Um, but um, I do believe that we can put mechanisms in place that can allow for a, a transfer of land and a payment for that uh, that can recognise the commercial value to Irish Rail of strategic land banks like that. But there are other, um, other state-owned um, bodies uh, and companies as well, but I think Irish Rail is probably the best example, um, particularly in the case of my own city. Um, um, but I, I suspect Gormanstown is, is, uh, is another example, uh, but I'm not familiar with that, but we look at it. Um, just uh, yeah, on the build to lease side, um, again, that, you know, the, the NAM and NARPS model whereby is, a, well, is essentially, yeah, buy to lease or build to lease. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I think if we could expand that, I mean, you know, if you look at the UK model, there's a huge reliance on approved housing bodies in the UK to build uh, and to manage large uh, property portfolios of social housing and often also specialised housing so whether it's for elderly whether it's for uh, you know in the disability sector um, you know you have specialised providers of certain types of housing I think we could do a lot more of that in Ireland uh, particularly actually if you look at our demographics in relation to purpose-built housing for the elderly around building communities um, that would uh, encourage um, maybe single individuals who are senior citizens who might be living in large family homes at the moment and having the cost and security concerns around that who may well want to move and allow that property to be, be occupied by, by a family uh, uh, or you know, um, uh, multiple tenants or whatever. Um, just to, in terms of attracting in funds, I mean, from my experience, there's a lot of offers at the moment from equity funds and from others looking to put funds together, whether it's from the European Investment Bank, whether it's from um, our own housing finance agency, whether it's ISAF or whether it's private funds. Um, finding a way to spend it, actually, is the, is the issue. Um, uh, the point that, that, that Mick raised earlier is true. I mean, the, the lending model for developers has totally changed. Uh, there isn't an appetite for banks at the moment to, to finance um, uh, developments beyond about 60% of the finance costs, and so the other 40% has to be made up with new financing models uh, that some developers are, are uncomfortable with and in some cases have been very expensive in terms of the financing options, and that is prohibitive, and we're looking at ways in which we can try and help that. Um, just around HAP, uh, there hasn't been much talk around uh, actually, you know, rent supplement and HAP. Um, um, but, you know, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, is encourage 
uh, tenants into HAP, but also landlords into HAP, and we're using the tax system to do that. So last November, as part of the package around rent certainty, the Minister for Finance introduced a tax measure whereby landlords can get 100% mortgage interest relief um, <coughs> uh, if they commit to having HAP uh, or rent supplement tenants for up to three years. Uh, and again, this is around trying to tip the balance away from, let's face it, you know, some landlords have um, you know, a view that discriminates against tenants that are relying on HAP or rent supplement. Um, and that's wrong. Uh, and we need to try and address that balance and that perception um, 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 so that we don't disadvantage um, uh, people who are in, in those circumstances. Um, so look, I, I, can I say that uh, uh, from one of the other uh, questions that was ans uh, asked earlier, uh, the, one, the one and a half billion euros or so that we're making available to local authorities for the social housing build and buy programme between 2015 and 2017, uh, if you look at the actual impact that we're predicting that that resource can have on housing lists in different local authorities, uh, you know, the average impact can be 25%. So by the end of 2017, if this money is spent and if the units are delivered on the back of that, uh, housing lists can be reduced by a quarter by the end of next year. Um, uh, in some counties it's higher, in others it's lower. In Dublin City Council, for example, is 21%. Um, um, but the, those figures are there if people want them. It's quite... A, it's quite so his constituency at the time, I think it was about 50, was it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Let's Tipperary is quite there, high, but I, and I, I Walkford was 50 as well. I couldn't, so I I couldn't, that. I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment on that. But the, oh, I can. The, 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 um, but Leitrim is 47, though, so it's, uh, there are there are other high ones as well. So look, can I just finish by saying, I, 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 first of all, thanks. Uh, I'd like to have stayed for longer if I could, but uh, I will look forward uh, to getting your report when you produce it. Uh, and if people want follow-up meetings in relation to the recommendations in it, we'll, we'll happily oblige. Uh, and if you need any information from us in terms of stats that we may have that you may need to finalise the report, just, uh, just ask for that. Minister, thank you and your officials for your attendance today. On behalf of the committee, I was pleased to see that in your opening statement you referred to issues like housing crisis and emergency situation because that's the manner in which this committee has been addressing this issue. From a practical point of view, the committee's report will be available in about two weeks' time, which we're pleased should feed nicely into the development of your action plan. And we're encouraged to hear that your action plan will actually pay due regard to some of the evidence-based recommendations that this committee hopes to make. Thank you for your attendance. Colleagues, we'll adjourn, we'll suspend till about 2.45. So we've got the, the managers coming in from the local authorities, and is there and the another department. presentation by the department as and well? And the department, yes. Okay. All together. So At 2.45. So we're there to take together? Yes. So we suspend now to 2.45. Is that agreed? Thank you.